Yeah, so this is totally impromptu. Um, I'm up here from Marshall, uh, I guess to, to add context. NASA has 10 field centers. Um, Marshall's one of them. The one that's probably closest to where we're standing right now is probably Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside the Washington, D.C. area. I guess in New York. Uh, we don't have anything in New York. Yes. Oh, I'm stream space studies. Oh, but that's part of that. I consider that to be part of that. Yeah, we got a software. <laughs> Close facility. Yeah, we got a software development facility in West Virginia and that sort of thing. But field center wise, there's 10 field centers. NASA headquarters is not a field center, but, uh, but it's, it's the headquarters for our government agency. And um, each field center has a uh, center chief technologist. So I'm the center chief technologist for Marshall. Uh, Marshall Space Flight Center is also the center that hosts and runs the Centennial Challenge program, which is why we are all up here in Worcester, Massachusetts, to, uh, to implement the Sample Return Robot Challenge that's been going on for the past couple of days. Um, Sam Ortega, I don't know if you've met Sam or seen Sam, but you will if you haven't already. No. Okay, yep, he'll be up here a little bit. Sam's the program manager. And uh, Sam doesn't work for me, but works with me. And uh, so we, we, uh, we, we work on the same floor back at Marshall. So I'm up here supporting his events, supporting his work, uh, talking to folks like you, um, answering questions about NASA, just uh, uh, letting you know that we're still very viable as an agency. We're still looking out to do great things technologically and uh, in the space. A lot of folks have been saying, oh, the retirement of the show program, yeah, it's really sad that NASA's closing. Where did you get that? <laughs> um, but that's that's a, a general public perception is that oh you know so many more space shuttles and uh, we're not doing the constellation program to the moon so obviously everything's over for the agency and that's just plain not true. Lots of other big plans that are in, in the works around the agency. The most recent is looking at a national mission to do an asteroid retrieval mission. So we're gearing up to do that. Uh, at Marshall, specifically, like I said, we do have 10 field centers, but each field center has a different area of expertise. Marshall is known for rocketry. Uh, we have a heritage in Werner von Braun, who was uh, the first field center director there. Um, you probably know a little bit about the history of von Braun. Came over to us uh, from Germany after the war, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have him hired on, first of all, at the Army, and then when the Army uh, ballistics agency was turned into Marshall Space Flight Center. He became our center director and was the manager for the Saturn V program, which eventually got us to the surface of the moon. So uh, we have that heritage in rocketry and propulsion. We continue that heritage today in developing what we uh, are calling the Space Launch System, or the SLS rocket. It's a heavy lift rocket that its initial inception will be able to lift 70 metric tons of payload. And uh, we're going to hopefully be using that to uh, to mount the Orion capsule on top and do manned missions eventually to, uh, to whatever asteroid we wind up retrieving and hopefully on to other destinations such as uh, Mars or Lagrange points or uh, uh, the lunar vicinity or wherever the uh, White House and Congress decides that the agency needs to go. Um, as a federal agency, we are, uh, we, we do get our orders and our directions from Congress and from the White House, so we don't just go and dream up things. We do uh, have to get approval for that. Uh, we're a federal agency, so our funding comes from the White House and Congress. But um, I just need to make sure it's very clear and dispel the myth that, uh, that we are closing shop, because we certainly aren't. We are looking to do great things in the future. Uh, let's see, other things about Marshall. So our heritage and our, uh, our prime area of investment is in rocketry and propulsion. But we do other things, as was mentioned. We're certainly trying to take advantage of the new movement into technology such as additive manufacturing or 3D printing and uh, advanced materials and manufacturing capabilities. We are involved in the process of developing the first in-space additive manufacturing 3D printing uh, payload for the space station. So we're working that right now and hope to have that launched within the next year and a half or so. Uh, that way we can put 3D printing in space on the space station with the idea of getting used to this concept of launching. Every time we launch things, we won't have to launch a spare for everything. Um, ideally, if you get, uh, get into space and something breaks, you don't have to go to your spare closet and figure out where the spare is. You can just ask for the design to be uploaded through, uh, through uh, telemetry transmission to your spacecraft and then you 3D print what you need. 
you use the tool and then you put it back in the hopper so that the, the intrinsic material can be recycled into the next thing that you need. That's the big plan. We're still working on how that all will, will play out, but uh, hopefully the game plan is to do something like that. Imagine if you had to launch a spare or a tool for every little thing that you'd ever need in the space. That's a lot of mass. And mass is critical. Uh, every, every ounce of mass that we launch from, uh, from Earth to orbit is propulsion capability that, uh, that you have to expend. So if we can reduce the amount of mass that we launch to orbit, so much the better for being able to put humans and, and viable scientific uh, experiments uh, up there instead of just a lot of spares. Um, so we're doing additive manufacturing work. We also have an effort in environmental life support. So Marshall's the center that's been working on air and water and waste reclamation and recycling. Instead of just launching a whole lot of fresh water and such, ideally, even though it sounds kind of gross, we want to be able to use human output waste products, recycle them and filter them into uh, new products that they can continue to use in a closed loop system. Uh, if we're going to do a Mars mission that's going to last well over a year, then we've got to be able to figure out how to continue to recycle this. Um, so manufacturing, uh, environmental life support, we're looking at, I mentioned propulsion, of course, but we're looking at advanced propulsion technologies that can be used in space. Instead of just the basic rockets that you think of that launch uh, things from Earth level to orbit, once you get up there, we're looking at other technologies that can get it from Earth orbit to our destination. Things like solar sails, not cells, but sails. I know the southern accent may be hard to do, but solar sails where you deploy something and use that photon pressure from the sun to propel things across the solar system. Electrodynamic tethers. If you take a piece of conductive metal and you string it out and move it through a magnetic field, you're going to generate a current. And that current will have a certain force associated with it as it moves through that field, and we're looking at using that principle to move things around in Earth orbit, to change orbits, to change orbital planes and such. Uh, ionic propulsion, where you have a field and you have ions, you accelerate ions through a field and expel them from your spacecraft, and when you push things out one way, the spacecraft goes the other. So that's a new type of in-space propulsion that we're working on developing for, for moving things around the solar system. Um, so I'm just I'm trying to come up with other uh, esoteric technologies that the center does. We mentioned materials and manufacturing. We mentioned advanced, man, uh, advanced manufacturing and, and environmental life support, in-space propulsion. Um, I was involved in a project on working on hardening electronics for deep space use. So one of the most critical things that the agency has to solve if we're ever going to send humans to distant solar system destinations like Mars and such is the radiation environment. You get outside of Earth's magnetic field, we've got a nice protective magnetic field that not only allows us to use compasses to navigate, but also protects us from a lot of radiation that comes in from the sun and from deep space. Once you get outside of that protective environment, you're exposed to whatever radiation shows up. Um, as humans, we're not very hardened to that. Uh, a lot of radiation exposure can cause sickness and death and cancer and all sorts of ugly things. So what we have to do is either figure out some way to mitigate that radiation and shield ourselves from that radiation or get there faster to, to limit the dosage. So we're looking at radiation mitigation techniques and shielding. Also, not just pink squishy things like us, but also uh, sensitive electronics are susceptible to radiation. We've been involved in technologies that allow electronics to be hardened to that radiation, taking processors like, uh, like are in your cell phones and laptops and such, and looking at methods of making those things so that if they do receive a radiation hit from a, from a higher particle of radiation, that they don't just completely shut down or get locked up or something, allow these things to continue operating through that radiation environment. Um, that's, that's another big area of technology. So any questions at this point? I've kind of rambled about some of the technology work that we do at Marshall. There's plenty of other technology efforts going on at other field centers across the agency, but because I am from, from the, the Huntsville facility, that's the one that I know probably the most. <coughs> but, uh, you guys any, have anything you want to ask? Yeah. Um, Let's see. Let's take a question first. That's fine. So you have a lot of technologies that are unmet to use in space. I was like, how, how much of a challenge is and this is related to uh, you know, this weekend's thing where we have a return mm -hmm. How will those translate to be developed here on Earth with entirely different, uh, different environments? 
Well, so the sample return uh, robot challenge was, let me, let me talk a little bit about the Centennial Challenge program, and I'm going to come back to your question. Centennial Challenges, as a program, is sort of a new way of developing technologies in that we are asking citizen inventors to work on their own and come up with some way of solving the problem and then bring it over to us during one of these challenge events to see if it meets those minimum requirements and can actually win some award money. Uh, the challenges are intentionally meant to be challenging because if they were too easy, we'd have everybody show up and claim award money. So they're, they're difficult. Last year, we didn't have anybody win anything. Uh, this year, we had uh, one team win something, which I'm not supposed to announce who it is because the social media team will help us. <laughs> we'll be announcing that later. Um, but they're hard. They really are hard. The, the approach, the, the standard approach NASA takes to technology is we get a bunch of money and we put out a, a solicitation. We have proposals come back in. Whoever wins that proposal gets a bunch of money to go off and develop the technology and then deliver it to us on some sort of a schedule. And that tends to be expensive. So we've tried Centennial Challenges as a new approach to say, we're not going to pay anybody anything until they come to us with the technology and then we'll award a prize. That's proving to be uh, an interesting approach to doing things in that we're not putting loads of money up front, we're putting the prize money at the end, and what we're getting back are very innovative uh, solutions to the kind of things that we're, that we're uh, proposing. Now, specifically to the sample return robot challenge, NASA wants to be able to autonomously go to some location program up what it's looking for, some geologic formation or, or uh, 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 maybe spaces or locations where water is most likely to be resident or, or whatever it is, and be able to allow these mobile robotic units to often autonomously find this stuff. Right now, any Mars lander that we put on the surface, uh, Sojourner and, and the Mars uh, exploration rovers and even the current Curiosity rover, those are all very heavily and carefully monitored from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And every little movement that those things make are highly orchestrated with the ground control guys. That thing doesn't move a bit unless they say, we want you to go from here to there, we're going to map it around these obstacles. They're trying out some autonomous routines that allow it to drive a certain distance on its own, but they're still working on So what we're looking to do here is new technologies that allow these things to go off and autonomously go grab things on their own. Now, your question specifically is, see, it took a long time to get there. I remember, I remember what it is. Things that are developed here on Earth, how do those translate to being used in a different location? And they probably don't directly translate. However, as an example that I heard yesterday, um, Sam Ortega, who's the, the program manager, was telling me that one of the teams had asked about possibly using uh, a, a balloon as their beacon. Okay, so. The challenge is set up to sort of kind of emulate, you're on the surface of the moon, you have to go pick up some, some <coughs> interesting samples from different locations. You can put a beacon down on your landing pad, but you have to be able to leave that, go get the sample, and come back to that. And a lot of the, a lot of the teams use beacons or, or uh, uh, indicators to show them what the pad was, visual indicators. One team had questioned using a balloon. But the response was, you probably don't want to use that because there's no atmosphere on the moon, and any balloon you try to use will just simply, you know, <laughs> truly on the lunar surface, it would not flow because it's the atmosphere that lets balloons float. So they were argued out of using a balloon because that really didn't go along with the idea of being on the lunar surface. <clears throat> now, at the same time, I noticed yesterday as some of the teams were working, it kind of got kind of breezy in the afternoon. and. Um, and uh, the, the sun was out early in the morning, but by the time we got the afternoon with some of the storm moving in, it had gotten very overcast. And that changed the way the sample uh, produced shadows. So under a lot of direct sunlight, it had a very distinct shadow. Under an overcast, it, was, it wasn't so distinct. And that changed some of the ways that the robots detected where the sample was. So you probably wouldn't get that on the lunar surface either, but that's just one of those things we have to live with in, in, in doing the challenge here for us. Um, the technologies developed under these challenges may not have direct use. We may not be able to just pick up a robot that's developed here and throw it on the lunar surface. We would certainly have to do some modifications because of the environment. But the software, the algorithms, the 
the techniques, the LIDAR used, some of the uh, image processing systems, those are the things that we want to see people develop that we may be able to use when it comes to an actual image. So, so you're right, it doesn't directly translate, but some of the core technologies probably would be something that we would go for. Does that, does that address what you were looking yeah. for? We, we acknowledge the fact that that's not the image service. We just have to live with the, with the constraints. But if you can it could have rained very much. That's right. We, we have, <laughs> if, if, if it had rained during one of the challenge days, I'm not sure exactly how they would have handled the, the rain day. But we would not have run the challenge in four years. You had a question in the back? Yeah. Uh, first, um, I would like to m commend NASA for inviting all of us. You guys, I don't know. It's almost like as soon as the whole space program as we know it changed, it seems like your social presence and everything else has skyrocketed. I wish that happened before. Maybe there could have been more money put in your direction or whatever case. But this is, you guys are doing a phenomenal job as far as connecting with the community and having these fantastic events. So that's number one that I wanted to say. Um, but number two, how are things like SpaceX, SpaceX, Elon Musk, is there a relationship between what they're doing there with the recyclable uh, uh, rockets uh, and you know, MakerBot and the 3D printing and the stuff that they're doing, how does it relate to NASA, if any? Is there a relationship there? There is a relationship. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship where we're trying to stay at least an arm's length distance from some of the private industries, but we are subsidizing them because we want them to succeed. We live in an age now to where spaceflight is not the exclusive domain of the government agency. Um, we, uh, you know, without retelling the entire story, of course, as a government agency, I mentioned earlier, we have government budgets that are approved through Congress and the White House and such, but they're limited. You know, NASA has a limited budget. Our budget is approximately, make sure I get the numbers right, approximately one half of 1% of the entire output of each annual federal budget. So, so 0.5% uh, of the entire federal budget. And with that, we're able to do all the things that you see NASA doing on an annual basis. But we can't do everything. So at this point in the development of spaceflight, we did the Apollo stuff, and we did all the, the, the Mars rovers and such. But we've come to a point where the technology is accessible to people who actually have enough money to privately fund it. So you get Elon Musk and SpaceX, and you get uh, Sierra Nevada, you get Orbital, you get other companies that are putting together privately owned launch vehicles that are, are working on doing services for NASA. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to free up resources that we would otherwise be putting into transport to get uh, services and crew from Earth to the space station and focus our budget and attention on doing some of the things that the private industry either can't afford to do or has, has no business incentive to do. There's probably no business incentive at this point to, to develop uh, an asteroid retrieval. I know some businesses have talked about it, but they talk about asteroid mining. Personally, I can't think of anything on an asteroid you couldn't find here that's less expensive. But, but maybe, maybe they know something like that. Um, so we've been putting our resources into things that don't have good business incentive for private industry. And it's actually turned out to be a very beneficial partnership. We've got contracts with several uh, commercial space entities to launch cargo from the Earth's surface to space station, and we've seen SpaceX successful in several different uh, missions on getting their Dragon capsule to dock at the space station and provide cargo to the space station. Eventually, they want to do crew. They're not there yet, and we're still looking at how you certify that to make sure that it's safe, but at the same time, that's their liability because they own the spacecraft. It's no longer you know, NASA's liability because we're not the ones that are their owners of the spacecraft. But we're still trying to make sure that that's, that's a safe thing to do. There's actually, you know, an interesting discussion is um, just as the FAA certifies pilots for their skills and ability and the aircraft for their viability, because every aircraft has to be certified by the FAA, should there be some regulatory uh, agency that certifies crewed vehicles for space flight? And that's, you know, that, there's, there's an interesting debate going on about that. There's not a decision made as to what they're going to do yet, but, um, but it is kind of interesting to listen in on what's being talked. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good partnership. We don't regulate what they are doing, uh, but we do advise and we do subsidize what's going on with some of the commercial entities. So we've provided some funding to them to encourage their development and to get uh, those services 
to, to, to launch cargo from Earth to the space station. Did, did that address yeah. your question? Okay, good. good. Yeah, and, and back to what your previous comment was, uh, NASA as an agency, so think of all the federal agencies you can come up with, you know, the IRS has been in the news recently, uh, Social Security NSA. Agency, FDA, you know, all of these, all of these, all these agencies. Uh, NASA has, because of the nature of the things we do, being innovative and being things that have never been done before, we try to be as, as innovative and progressive as possible when it comes to things like social media and web presence and, and that kind of thing. So your compliments are appreciated. You know, we are, we are certainly trying to, to be very progressive and, and not just be a stodgy, old, bloated government agency, but try to you know, be out there and make good things happen for the public. Because after all, you know, it's been said before, it's kind of corny, but NASA doesn't belong to us, it belongs to you. You guys are taxpayers, I'm a taxpayer, it's your agency. So uh, trying to make sure that we put that return on your investment that is uh, as beneficial as possible. Anything else? Other questions? Comments? Anything you've always wanted to say thanks to? <laughs> 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 Since you with propulsion, uh, pulse jets. Um, and actually, uh, ionic propulsion, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, we could actually use a uh, nuclear uh, material for ionic propulsion, we yep. could probably get like a quarter of the speed of light. I agree. I agree. Are we uh, working on anything like that? Or? I agree. We are working on nuclear work. But <laughs> nuclear is hard to deal with because you have to do it safely, and that's been you know that's been a, a, a technology difficulty that we continue to to progress uh, in overcoming. You're absolutely right. Nuclear does provide the most amount of power in the most compact volume uh, and mass that you can launch. So we're looking at how can you take that to power what you just said, ionic propulsion and such. But those currently are still systems of the future. It's a technology investment area that we are continuing to look at what are the issues associated with it, but we're not there yet. But do know that it's definitely part of the, of the plan on things we are working on. Uh, we're not there yet, we haven't deployed it. It's not something that we can just go out there and put on board a rocket because of some of the safety issues and such. But we are working with the Department of Energy, who is the United States lead wow. in, well, anything nuclear, <laughs> Department of Energy regulates. And so if we're gonna start playing with nuclear stuff, the Department of Energy at least has to understand what we're doing. Cassini is, is nuclear power, isn't it? Cassini is nuclear power, but it's these RTGs, radioactive thermal electric generators. So what they do is they take plutonium and use the decay of the plutonium and the heat that it generates and take that heat and transduce it into electricity for the spacecraft. So it's not an active uh, nuclear reactor like what you would see out here in your power plants where you're regulating it through dampening rods and such. It's just simply heat that's coming off of the, of the decay of plutonium. So it's a little bit of a different, uh, a different way of getting electricity, but it still produces electricity through a nuclear decay. What we want to do though is we want to get to where we're using more active uh, nuclear materials to get a higher level of, of energy. Um, and when you talk about nuclear stuff, there's, there's two different things you can talk about. One is propulsion and one is power. One of the ways of getting nuclear propulsion is to use a reactor to just generate lots of heat, lots of heat that you then flow uh, liquid fuel like hydrogen through. That hydrogen picks up all of that heat is, and is expelled as, as, a, as a rocket engine and that's where you get your propulsion. Not necessarily from the nuclear uh, <coughs> material itself, but through the quick heating and expansion of that hydrogen. So we're looking at engines that can do that in space. But uh, you know, lots of different things you can do with nuclear, uh, nuclear materials. It's just you have to be safe about it. And for good or bad, without expressing any personal views, you have to be politically correct about it. There's a lot of folks who just don't want to see nuclear stuff flying in space. So you know, we have to address that concern as well. I want to <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like I said, I can express no, personal views, but you do have to be politically correct. I don't think I would solve them. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Yes. How is your portion of what you're doing affected by sequestration? Um, so sequestration, it's uh, it's troubling that the economy <coughs> from the government's point of view has come to this. How it affects us is we did receive cuts. We are one of the few government agencies that didn't have to lay people off, fortunately. Part of that. 
What's that? Furlough. Furlough. Okay. Yeah, he's right. The right terminology. I love the furlough. Yes, Laying off means you don't come back unless they advise you. Furlough just means you go home for a day or two to save some money. Uh, a lot of the DOD agencies have had to go into a furlough situation to send federal employees away without paying for a couple of days just to meet their uh, sequestration budgets. The way NASA has structured its budget, we didn't have to do that. Uh, but that's not to say that we won't have to in the future. It has slowed down some things. It has put additional restrictions on our ability to attend technical conferences uh, and additional restrictions on travel, which is unfortunate because, again, <coughs> an agency that our responsibility is being innovative and providing information back to the taxpayer for the benefit of you guys who put money into the agency, particularly scientific and uh, technology information. One of the prime ways of doing that is traveling to technical conferences. And with sequestration, restricting our ability to do that, it's, it's, it's difficult. But um, at the same time, it hasn't brought us to a dead stop. We are still dealing with it. Uh, we spend a lot of time, as can tell you, doing CFOs, uh, chief financial officer sort of discussions and what our budget looks like and planning for uh, what sequestration could do in the future. But it didn't completely eliminate our budget. It just reduced it for a bit. And we're still doing the following it's, it's a hindrance, but it's not a, a total problem. It'd be nice if it wasn't there. <laughs> it's the reality of it. 